So welcome back. We're going to uh, keep this journey going on FinTech. We spoke about payments in our last class. And here in class seven, we're going to dive into credit. And there's a lot to cover. There are so many different segments and sectors in the credit space. And there's a lot going on with financial technology, not just because of artificial intelligence and open API, uh, but even the earlier things that were brought into the techno technology stack around mobile phones and, and the like still gives a lot of opportunity to break in here and the use of alternative data. Um, so I'm going to uh, uh, bring up, uh, uh, sh share some slides and uh, uh, get going here. Um, uh, first, I should also say to those who uh, celebrate such things, happy Earth Day, uh, April 22nd. It's also my daughter's birthday, my eldest, my first daughter out of three. So today's a, a special day, Earth Day, and my daughter's birthday. So. Happy birthday, Anna. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so I'm going to do a little update on Facebook. We spoke about Facebook in our last class uh, about payments. And there were interesting announcements. Actually, as we were together, Facebook was announcing some updates. And then dive into the credit uh, world. And before we dive into FinTech, just talk a little bit about those credit sectors and the market design and credit. And that provides, as we'll see, some of the disruptive uh, potential and how disruptive tech can break into the credit value chain. And what you're always looking for in a business, whether it's about FinTech or otherwise, is somehow to break into another party's value chain or to create value for customers. Either you can create value where others haven't seen it or you want to break into somebody else's value chain. So we'll talk a little bit about that, how we, we uh, see that particularly in this uh, area of financial technology. Uh, and then a review of the competitive landscape by the different marketplaces. A touch on marketplace lending and credit scoring. And then I'll close with just a comment on professionalism and academic integrity as people were gearing up for their papers and group work and so forth again. Um, they were, they, the readings included a review of 12 fintech companies. This was just a taste test. There was one article in reaction to Apple credit card. And these were fintech companies in the credit card space. But as we'll see today, we're going to review a lot of the other spaces as well. Uh, a, a brief article uh, that I thought was helpful about how tech companies are seeing how to get into the lending business. Uh, big tech, particularly marketplace lenders, will look at Lending Club uh, more particularly, and then alternative data. Um, study questions, again, are just sort of not just for you to gear up and prepare for the class, but this is sort of where I want to sort of end uh, how we can think about this is really importantly, how big tech firms are positioning themselves to offer credit. And I don't know, Romaine, if anybody's going to sort of uh, get the cobwebs off and, and give us some thoughts, but uh, I'm going to turn it to Romaine to see if there's anybody that wants to just give a thought, broad overview of big tech in this space, whether it's from China, Europe, uh, the US, Latin America. OK, let's go for today's class. Who would like to be the first volunteer? Michael, thank you. Um, I guess some, some from the article, some from just kind of seeing over the last decade what's going on, there's been a lot more availability of lending. I think Lending Club was, I, I kind of saw more from like a personal investing point of view, but kind of thinking of like who can actually have access to credit has been a huge position of tech in the US and also uh, just speed. I think like the traditional um, just credit process for consumers and small businesses has been like kind of gainful. So but that's definitely a big uh, area that big tech is trying to uh, tackle with AI and uh, just automated processes. Right. 
right. But Michael, could you add to it sort of like, think about big tech companies. How, how are big tech companies strategically positioning themselves? I mean, Lending Club and the marketplace lenders are a very important uh, trend here um, as well. These, these sort of more disruptive companies, some of them becoming incumbents in their space. But how about uh, the big platforms? I guess embedding it with their current services products that they already have but like apple pay was a good example where it's just kind of everybody's already using an iphone so if they can just make it seamless with their existing processes and pay so this is again remind uh, well i see a couple other hands up so uh Romain. alessandro yeah i think also um amazon is a very interesting case where um thanks to all the data they have gathered on the sellers on their marketplace they were able to uh, offer short-term lending to all the sellers on the marketplace and this also gives them a sort of competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis banks commercial banks first of all because the notional of this lending is very small so it's comparable to sort of micro lending and second because they have access to a huge amount of data on the business of these uh, sellers Right. And uh, third, they have a direct access to repayment because um, basically these repayments are kind of automatic from the business of these sellers on the Amazon marketplace. Right. So what, what Michael and Alexandro have sort of said <coughs> is, well, first we talked a little bit about uh, the disruptors, but in terms of big tech, they have a lot of network advantages whether it's Apple and there's so many people that have their phones and their products, whether it's Amazon in the case that Alexander, we can go to other countries as well. This is certainly true in, in a very significant way in China, but it, it's not just isolated in China and the US, is that they have big networks of, of users. They collect data. And particularly if you're mer marketplace like Amazon or Alibaba, when you're selling product, you're seeing both sides of a market. You're seeing the consumer side, the hundreds of millions of people in China or the tens of millions of people in the US, but you're seeing the merchant side. And so that data and that flow and that activity gives you a natural competitive uh, edge. And then lastly, what was just mentioned is automatic payment, particularly if you're in an online platform selling something, you see that merchants payment stream, but also you lower the credit risk because consumers are buying, you take your piece to pay back, whether it's a revolving or term loan to a merchant. So a lot of competitive uh, uh, edges or even advantages in this space for them to sort of build upon to provide a credit product. CG, uh, would also like to share a thought? Sure, please. Um, yeah, I think the case of Alibaba is really interesting because um, just like Gary had mentioned, um, there are a lot of transaction data and also user data in Alibaba. Um, so right now, Alibaba not only offer the um, like the payment system, it also offer a credit system. Like you can borrow money from Alibaba. Actually, it has its own credit system that can, um, I mean, the credit rating. They can determine like how much money you can borrow from Alibaba. So I think this case is really interesting. Yeah, so two things that I think uh, I want to tease out of that is the idea of building credit on top of payments. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. This goes back centuries that any any good banker knew that if you were in the center of payments, you had more information, you had more data, even in a pre-computer age. Um, but what we find is a lot of the big tech companies, as well as the disruptors, chose to get into the payment space and then build upon that credit. Now, as it relates to Alibaba, what better way to do that than to provide a payment mechanism to purchase the products on your platform, similar with Amazon. And then you can build credit upon that because you get an incredible amount of data, but also you can provide credit in what's called point of sale credit. Uh, buy something, pay for it over six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks when you're purchasing. So uh, 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 good points. So what is marketplace lending? This, this phenomena that uh, uh, 
uh, started out of the United Kingdom. We'll talk a little bit about Lending Club here in the US. Uh, started about a dozen to 15 years ago. Um, what, what, what is it in its theory and where, where is it right now? Uh, anybody want to uh, chat about uh, that for a minute? Lending Club, Lending Tree, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies that we can chat about here. Alida? Um, yeah, so marketplace and peer-to-peer -peer lending is kind of the concept of allowing um, individuals to lend to other individuals um, or companies through a marketplace. And while they've, they've been around for a while, um, but they've really just turned into kind of lending platforms. Um, and they're really supported by a securitization market um, behind them now, rather than individuals um, lending on the platform for the most part. Right, right. And Michael spoke about this earlier as well. I think it's an interesting concept, but that it hasn't actually lived up to its early promise. The promise, when this came about in 2005 to 2007, was that you and I could use the internet to communicate and I could lend to you and you could borrow from me peer to peer without sort of a central uh, intermediary. Now, there was always gonna be some intermediary because there was a platform, a, 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 a software provider taking a fee, but somehow matching uh, lenders to borrowers in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, what we found over these 13 or 15 years is that the marketplace lenders like Lending Club have shifted to securitization market to raise their money, a, a highly organized and somewhat centralized market, securitization market. And on the lending side, you're still very much seeing that you're going through a portal and that, you know, there's only so many of these portals. So it's not that it's truly peer to peer. And in fact, often it's now called marketplace lending and its platforms. Um, <clears throat> I think that it, it, it's still a very important part of the disruptive credit landscape. Uh, but it's a small percentage of that marketplace, and it and it's shifting very dramatically from peer to peer to uh, online portals that still access centralized uh, uh, credit in many ways. And we'll see. We'll chat a little bit about Lending Club is even uh, buying uh, announced earlier in 2020 to buy a bank and and uh, merge with the bank uh, it, itself. Um, and then there's already been some. Uh, discussion of alternative data, but alternative data, building upon a history, history in many countries for four or five decades to use data to make credit decisions, but changing it. And I see a hand raised on this, maybe, Romain, or no? I don't see any hands raised, but I'm sure one will come up. Going down. Um, so where does that take us? Um, let me go back to Facebook Libra just for a moment. And this is where we closed our last class is that Facebook Libra had announced in June of 2019. And then the People's Bank of China had already been working on the digital currency project, but then they sort of sped that up a bit and announced within a month or two that they were gonna move forward with their currency project. Libra had announced a, a token pegged to four or five other currencies. So it was a multi-currency basket. And there was a lot of pushback from central banks around the globe on this concept that they would create what Facebook actually announced, a global currency for billions of people. Uh, there was concern amongst the G7 and G20 countries, but there was also concern of a broader group of countries, developing countries as well, as to what this meant for their monetary policy, how, how uh, stable this would really be, and whether it would compete with fiat currencies in a, not just a positive way, but maybe a negative way. And there were also a lot of concerns about whether it would support and, and, and somehow become the domain of illicit activity, uh, drug runners and the like and so forth. So Facebook is a big company. They're, they're, they, 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 they stub their toes from time to time. This might've been one of those times, but it was an innovative project. So they announced last week some changes. And most importantly for this conversation, 
and this is just a slide taken um, from, I think it was a medium post I found. Uh, they said that Libra would now be a platform and they would do single currency tokens, a euro token, a US dollar token, a, a sterling token, et cetera, et cetera. They'll still have a multi basket, a multi currency basket coin called Libra, but they'll have what's in essence stable value tokens. And they feel that there's still enough opportunity, or is what we talked about pain points in the payment system that a dollar token, a euro token, a British sterling token um, and, and the like is relevant and important and an important layer. What Libra also announced is that they're taking a tiered approach to this whole topic of anti-money laundering and know your customer. In essence, working with governments around the globe, they're saying they would only work with wallet providers this would be single currency wallet providers or multi-currency Libra wallet providers. They'd only work with a digital wallet provider if it was in a jurisdiction that had regulation and those wallets and, and exchanges, if it was on a crypto exchange, were well regulated within those countries or at least regulated and registered within those countries. Uh, under the guidance around the globe that's issued by the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, or sort of the anti-money laundering standard setters around the globe. And they said that they wanted to take a tiered approach that would even include on the permission blockchain in the protocol layer, in the software itself, some protections against sanctions. Now, they didn't say whether it was sanctions uh, there were UN sanctions, European sanctions, US sanctions, and then you get into some interesting geopolitical issues as to how Libra, the associations would sort through this. But it's interesting, Facebook is not giving up just because there's a lot of pushback. And for those of you that might watch this online and might watch it in 2021 or 2022, because this uh, course will have a life uh, for a while offered online, it will be interesting to look back and see what other adjustments have Facebook and Libra done in, in 2020 and 2021 to continue to uh, meet the official sector kind of uh, and, and, and bring this thing to life, uh, to life um, going forward. Any questions on, on Libra? I, I had the opportunity, they actually reached out to me last week after our class and they, they wanted to give you a little briefing to your faculty member on this. I don't see any hands raised, right. Gary. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sneak into credit. So what are the credit sectors? I mean, we all know them. This, this is uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Household sector and corporate sector. But the household sector, the big pieces, and those of you that took the uh, half semester consumer finance course remember all this, you know, mortgages, autos, credit cards, personal loans, student loans, and then you can have subsectors. If you're thinking about disrupting this space, you would think, all right, where am I gonna slice into? Am I gonna try to do something in mortgages or credit cards or where? Am I gonna try to go sort of to the high end, the low credit risk, super prime? Or am I gonna try to be in the subprime marketplace? And, and these markets are vast. They're vast in nearly every country. So you'd sort of pick and target what you're actually going for. And literally, whether you're picking debt consolidation or point of sale lending matters as well. The corporate sector is interesting. In terms of FinTech, the corporate sector has been disrupted dramatically in earlier decades by the securitization markets. And, and asset securitizations happen primarily around the household sector, but asset securitization or a way to fund lending through the securities markets has come to the real estate and more recently to the collateralized loan markets or CLO markets. But in fact, when we really think about these markets, what's been focused on in terms of financial disruption is primarily the household sector. And then I've circled the small business and small and medium-sized enterprise. Now, SME, mid-market companies, can be defined all sorts of ways. In the middle of this corona crisis in the US, 
we seem to have latched on to companies that are less than 500 employees. It's not, it's not a specific definition somewhere around the globe. But large enterprises can access the securities markets directly. Large enterprises are by and large borrowing from big banks or securities markets. And the greatest opportunities have really been in the small business or SME marketplace. And it could be products like cash advance products, purchase credit, working capital lines. We'll get a little bit into this. But again, if you're thinking about credit, it's a vast market, and it's not one to just forget about, you know, all the little pieces uh, in there. Um, Romain, I think there were some questions. Sure. Yes, we have a question from Victor. Please. I want to ask about the Libra. We see the point of why it's in between building coins, um, euro, dollar, whatever. The dollar, the stable, the stable dollar already exists in the cryptocurrency market. And I, even in that case, I don't fully understand what are the advantages beyond trading with SVs. So, okay. So, Romain, Victor was cutting in and out. I think, I think, if I understood the question, is uh, back to Facebook and why they have the stable individual currencies. But I'm not certain. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, around the globe there are definitely shortcomings of our fiat payment systems, these pain points. Some of it just relates to whether the pay payment systems are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In terms of the euro, actually uh, the target payment system run by the European Central Bank does have attributes of 24 seven. Uh, uh, the US, we have more challenges in that regard. But the bigger, big, the bigger issue often in payment systems are costs. And so what Facebook Libra is saying is we can provide something that can compete in this, in this space. But money is already digital. Fiat money, the euro is already digital. So Libra and Facebook are not providing that. They're saying this is a different digital euro or a different digital dollar that can maybe move 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where you can get instantaneous settlement. Now the US Federal Reserve is moving there and will be there by 2023 or 24. And in fact, even in the US, the clearinghouse, as we talked about, the organization of about 24 major banks have a, a continuous real-time payment system. Europe is already moving to that continuous real-time payment system. So you might say, <clears throat> why would, would a Libra Euro compete with that? Partly because it would be on the, on the Facebook platform. And the thought is that Facebook would embed it into their system it's to some extent to try to compete with what Amazon and Alibaba and, and Tension are doing elsewhere as well. Um, but I, I, I sort of implied in your question is, so what, why would this matter? And I think it's a competitive landscape and time will tell us whether it re will really matter. Because we already have digital euros. This would be a different form of a digital euro. It's like the kind of an overlap, I guess. That's right. That's right. Um, and I think, Gary, you. on the same topic, we might have a question from Luke. Please, Luke. Again, Luke's not coming through. I don't know. I am, I'm here. Um, so easy question is, what is the main difference between Libra 1.0 and the 2.0? Because 1.0, I believe, was suggesting currency basket. And second question was, regarding Lending Club, it's down a lot, 42% um, in three months and 93% since five years. And will it drive during the consumer liquidity crunch, that is the quarantine recession we have now? Um, or suffer from high leverage because it acquired a brick and mortar bank, which seems untimely these days. Yeah. And in regarding the currency basket, wouldn't it suffer during economic downturns when there's a distortion between safe currencies such as the US dollar, Swiss franc, and the emerging, margin, uh, emerging market currency, that is RMB or whatever they're really putting in the basket? Yeah. First, let me uh, compliment. I love the Edward Monk that you have behind you. I, I, I assume it's just a visual, but if it's an original, protect it safely. Um, uh, to your second question, Lending Club, 
I think that all of the marketplace lenders uh, have some challenges in the middle of the corona crisis. I think that their promise, their early promise, hasn't proved out completely. So you're right that it went, it went, it's a public company actually, Lending Club. It went public. Its stock came off dramatically, 70 or 80 percent, even before, even be well before this uh, corona crisis. And then it, within the crisis, it's come off some more as well. Um, it's buying a bank. It's not technically a bricks and mortar bank. That bank, I think, has one location in Massachusetts, maybe in Boston. Um, it's an online bank. And what they're trying to do, their theory of the case, is that they want to lower their borrowing costs because marketplace lenders, and we'll see this in, in a moment, arrange with some banks to borrow money. So marketplace lenders borrow from the markets, some of it's securitized, some from banks. And what they're saying is we can maybe lower our costs by uh, embedding a bank. Back to Libra and Facebook and the like, the main difference between Libra 1.0 and 2.0 are the two that I mentioned. I mean, they would say there's three or four other changes, but one is rather than only be a multi-currency coin, Libra, they're adding individual coins. They're not getting rid of the multi-currency coin. The multi-currency coin is still there. It's still their aspiration to have a multi-currency coin but they're adding the single coins to try to give a new digital euro, digital dollar to it. And secondly, they're adding much more um, uh, know your customer anti-money laundering regimes by saying, look, we're only gonna work with digital wallets and crypto exchanges in certain jurisdictions which are registered and following anti-money laundering law and additionally, we'll embed in the software some protocols literally in the software to guard against <clears throat> either sanctions and some other things. Whether this will be enough to satisfy the official sector, yet to be seen. It looks like they're moving first with Switzerland and trying to have Switzerland's uh, regulator FINMA uh, uh, captured and move forward. I'll take one brief more question because we've got a lot to cover, but sure. So Sally had her hand up for a while. If you want to talk, unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I'll just ask Grace bri briefly, but um, with household uh, credit sectors, how are they preventing against predatory lending? Um, because just through reading some of the articles, um, it seems like that becomes a gray line um, when you're targeting specific type of customer um, who doesn't qualify for traditional loans. So you're talking about more broadly just in terms of how do we guard in, in any country uh, against predatory lending. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. The entire credit space has a lot of, of protections and regulations starting in, well, I would say starting hundreds of years ago, really, uh, one would even go back to the Hammurabi Code and say there was regulation of interest rates. But in the modern days, we embedded, let's take the US for a moment, uh, two really important things. One was the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or what some people call ECOA, which was in the late 1960s. And then uh, something called the Fair Credit Reporting Act, I think by 1972, these two, uh, uh, came out of an earlier wave of fintech, an earlier wave of credit cards, an earlier wave of, of, of lending, and, and, and directly to this question about whether it was fair and whether it was equal. Everybody had the same access, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, that you couldn't differentiate because of gender, or race, or nationality, and the like. Um, and fair credit reporting, that those credit reports, that the, the things that we came to know and, 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 and about 30 countries rely on this, this FICO scores from a company called the Fair Isaac Company, uh, that those scores, we'd have to be able to know something about them. And if we were turned down, somebody has to explain to us how, how we were turned down. Well, now fast forward to 2020, Absolutely, the question is right. How can we protect that we still have equal credit 
and that it's that it's explainable and why is somebody turned down and once somebody is not uh, allowed to take uh, uh, credit it, it gets tougher with artificial intelligence and machine learning it also gets tougher when there's not a physical location and thirdly many of these companies are not regulated or registered as banks and regulators around the globe uh, tended to look to banks to make sure that these laws were uh, uh, fairly applied. Now, they also look to the credit reporting agencies. So I think the real answer is, in these changing times, the, the official sector around the globe has to adapt and sometimes change a little bit of who's regulated. And even if you're a non-bank, that you still have to comply with some of these things importantly. Um, yeah. um, so let me just give you a sense of the size and scope. The household sector, you can look at this later in the Canvas slides, but the household sector grown dramatically. And if you look in the, in the uh, uh, in United States, we're no longer the top, the top percent of GDP. Uh, in fact, I think Luke is uh, in, in Korea now, uh, your country is now peaked up to be number two, but look at China. China from 10 to 20% of GDP just 15 years ago, and all of a sudden 50% of GDP. So these markets have grown a lot in many countries. I wouldn't just think about this in, in the US. In Brazil and India, I would predict will grow significantly as well. Now in the US, we've got about $14 trillion of household debt. Before the corona crisis, we had a $22 trillion economy. And so you could see it's about two thirds of our economy, the underlying con consumer household debt. The corporate sector, very important as well, um, uh, but, but it's the household sector dominated in the US by mortgages, two thirds of that two thirds, or about 10 trillion, $11 trillion of mortgage market. Um, but each of these markets are really significant. Even the auto lending market, it might look small at, at uh, these numbers here, uh, might look small on here, but they're not. That's a big number when you sort of come, come at it and if you wanted to pursue that business. And a little bit on the non-financial corporate debt market, um, we'll see this shake out. Post the corona crisis, a lot of these numbers will go up significantly. And I would say one thing just off the topic of fintech, I think that though we didn't enter, we didn't enter this crisis with a household debt problem in most countries. We had a real household debt problem going into 2008 crisis. Well, we didn't enter this with a household debt crisis. Within three to six months in most countries, we will have a household debt crisis, I fear, because the consumer sector can't you know, be supporting their auto loans and credit card loans. And one of the reasons I think this is unlikely to be a V recession, but it's gonna be a long U recession, almost like it's a bathtub trying to get out the slippery slopes of this recession, is around the globe, households are gonna to have to repair their balance sheets. They're gonna to have to slowly repair balance sheets, and it's not gonna be easy. Um, so true also in the corporate sector, most likely. But the market design matters. If you were creating a fintech company, uh, you would think about the market design, and I'm not gonna dive into this, but each one of these pieces gives an opportunity to break into the credit markets. It might be around data. You might have a particular area that you could do better data. Or like Credit Karma, Credit Karma was really about providing free credit scoring. Think about this. Just free credit scores, and Credit Karma then could cross-sell and market your product. Credit Karma, a company that was formed less than 10 years ago, sold earlier in 2020 for $5 billion to Intuit. Intuit that has the tax, turbo tax and this software, uh, uh, accounting software and the like. But Credit Karma had 106 million files, 106 million individual files on uh, various folks, not all of whom are their customers, but they could cross sell. They had nearly a billion dollars of revenue in 2019. 
It might be on the funding side. You might have a new way to do securitization or your issuer bank partnership. And we talked about Lending Club had an issuer bank partner. Now they're trying to buy a bank. Uh, it might be on the funding side. And that's what peer-to-peer -peer lending tried to do, and they haven't been as broadly successful. Most importantly, I would say that it's usually been on user experience and user interface. And sometimes it's that you got in through the payment channels, like Toast getting into the restaurant sector through the payment. Toast was a company out of Boston that was really about software. It was about tablets and hardware as well that the restaurant server had a, a better user experience and the restaurant had a better experience in the tablet and payment side and then they started to build Toast Credit to provide those restaurants credit. Now there's gonna be a shakeout there, no doubt, in terms of uh, this crisis, the corona crisis. It might be that you're breaking into some slice of risk. Uh, and, and this has been a case for a lot of companies that have broken in to manage one risk or another better. And then lastly, what role are you in? In the mortgage markets here in the US, and we found that origination has really changed. And we'll look at the competitive landscape, but companies like Quicken Loan and Penny Mac and others have broken in and they've broken in on the origination side. And that's partly because of the uniqueness in the US mortgage market that our government sponsored enterprises guarantee the bulk of the market. So the balance sheet credit risk is diminished and Quicken Loan and Penny Mac and others can come in and probably over half the market is originated by companies that are broadly speaking disruptors. So again, it could be data, it could be funding, it could be the user experience, which is really a critical one, maybe the risks, the roles, any piece of these might give an opportunity to break into a market or to do something different than the financial incumbents. Um, so the, the uh, earlier FinTech, way back, I'm gonna take you to a story about an earlier FinTech that I like. It's just credit cards. The first use of the term credit card was in the 1880s in a, in a, a sort of a dystopian, I would call it, but utopian book that was written by Edward Bellamy. It was a New York Times bestseller. It was a bestseller in multiple languages around the globe talking about the year 2000. Well, Bellamy, you could go back and look at the book, it's really science fiction, but use the term credit card. It's the first known use of the concept that you would have a card for payments. Um, well, shortly thereafter, not really because of Bellamy, you saw a bunch of companies starting to use charge coins and charge cards. And by the 1920s, these merchant cards, you had an individual merchant providing credit and saying you can buy something on credit. You could call that a point of sale credit, earlier FinTech about 100 years ago. But in, not, in the 1940s, one banker in Brooklyn never made a lot of money for themselves. One banker came up with the concept of a credit system where it was multiple merchants, not one merchant, but multiple merchants. And that charge a card 75 years ago. So a long time ago, but still somewhat recent. And that led to the 1940s and 50s, all these innovations, the first plastic card, Bank America card was from a California bank and that's where Visa started. So all of that was FinTech of the time. And the only reason I mention it is that you think about what disruptions have come before that now we take for granted Sometimes that's evidence on what you might do now. Bank America was a California bank that was trying to partner with other banks around the country and partnered with other countries to do something uh, that was more universal for the country. The Diners Club was literally about this restaurant concept. You would consider it almost like a general merchant card, an early toast. The Diners Club did what maybe toast is trying to do now inside the restaurants providing more uh, use of those at, at initially high-end restaurants on the East Coast. Um, so what, what disruptions are in the value chain now? 
and particularly this, this little chart uh, um, I, I uh, borrow from an uh, interesting long paper on it is think about the different parts of the value chain, whether you're sourcing capital, you're actually assessing credit, that's the underwriting of the credit, or actually just servicing the credit like you're servicing a student loan. It could be any part of the value chain and you could go in and disrupt. And we're not gonna dive into this chart, but I'll just take disbursements for a minute. If you look at that vertical, it could be digital wallets or virtual currency or the machine learning. If it's in credit assessment, it could be the alternative data. So each of these provides a little opportunity to disrupt the current business model. And so we talked about payments last class, credit, you sort of really have to get in a sense granular into which part of the value chain and then how do I bring a technology to it that maybe the big incumbents aren't yet doing in a, in a sufficiently sophisticated way. Or you might just bring it to one sector like toasted to the restaurant sector. It might be sector specific. So where do we go? Well, we've already seen big techs there, the payment unicorns. There's hundreds of other payment companies that are building credit on top of payment. And sometimes a payment company is really also a credit company like Brex is both payment and credit. Avid Exchange is mostly payment, but is moving into credit. Um, and then some that are built just on credit. Um, and so I thought I would start with the business side, small, medium sized enterprise lending. Again, there's no really good definition of SME, but the definition that these companies would take at it, they would say, these are companies that are having difficulty borrowing from the big banks. They're, it's either assessing credit or providing that credit in a, in a, in a timely and, a, and cost effective way. Brex is an interesting company that started around the concept that I can't get, a, I can't get money as a startup. How can I even get a credit card if I had, a, you know, it's sort of a, a mixture of seed investing and, and, and um, 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 uh, credit card uh, provisions. Some of these companies I put on here like Amazon Alipay are big tech. I don't think you can leave them out. Some started in the payment side like Square and Stripe uh, and, and Toast, which I mentioned earlier, PayPal all provide small and medium-sized enterprise lending. Some are really just uh, like Cabbage and Lendio uh, provide comparison, that you can go on the Lendio platform and you can sort of compare and contrast. They're more like a broker or an agent than actually making the lending. And Funding Circle is one of the only ones that is sort of in the, in the, a little bit in the marketplace lending. I see some questions, Romaine. I'm just I'm doing a sort of thumbnail taste test here. So in the chat, there's quite some activity about Lending Club. Perhaps you can provide the class with an overview of their business model and what are the challenges they've been facing. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to do that in about uh, uh, 10 minutes. So I'll, I'll hold that if I can. Um, Lending Club has been more about uh, the household sector than the small medium size. Is anybody, I'll, I'll ask this, has anybody in the class actually worked at a startup, uh, worked at any corporation that's borrowed from one of these companies? Alida, you've unmuted yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, so I was at Citibank at the time, but Citibank partners with CTFO um, as a partner of their supply chain finance program to finance some of the smaller um, suppliers in those programs for large corporates. So, so isn't that, it's interesting, could you give, share, why did Citibank partner with CT, C2FO rather than make those loans themselves? And this is important, this the relationship with the incumbents between the disruptors. What, why in that one circumstance do you think Citi chose to partner rather than do it on their own? Um, C2FO is an interesting model. It actually allows the corporate to lend to its suppliers. Um, I guess the easiest way to say it kind of in short term um, form. But um, if you look at a supplier, a company's supplier base, 
Um, you'll see the 80 20 rule applies fairly well. So the top 20 suppliers are generally um, supplying a corporate with the majority of their inventory, whatever it is that they're, they're purchasing. And that bottom tail of the suppliers is um, they're all very small businesses. They're hard to lend to. It's very hard to do the, um, it's very hard to do all of the KYC requirements, which is really what Kitty Bank does not like doing, is the KYC. And so a company like C2FO could come in there, partner with the corporate and the city, and lend to or extend credit um, through a supplier guidance program. So this is an important aspect that Alita just raised. Large incumbents sometimes don't feel that they can, in a cost-effective way, assess the credit and reach the distribution to small businesses. And then the disruptive companies sort of say, well, wait, we can provide. That's a little crack in the system. That's something we can have more financial inclusion, whether it's Brex for the startup, C2FO for a lot of the small businesses and, and, and the like. And, and the incumbents say, all right, we can't, but we can through C2FO and others reach them and then it helps down the supply chain. I think Ivy's hand was up, maybe? Yes, correct, Ivy. Go ahead. Yeah, so I used to work in securitization and Brex was one of my clients. Um, and then also worked at a startup that uses Brex too. And so I think they, to your point of, um, like their user, their user interface is pretty amazing. And um, they've also just have like really identified this white space of, you know, startups. Um, but I think where we got comfortable in terms of the diligence um, is that the fact that, um, you know, they're, they're pretty much, it's a very elegant way of just like having these startups, making sure that they have literally enough cash in the account. Um, so they're monitoring that um, basically they have access to the startup uh, bank account day to day. And um, they started with startups and they've been very, um, I think thoughtful about which sectors they're going into, like life sciences and e-commerce and now um, having cash management, um, which also makes a lot of sense in terms of just having um, yield. So just wanted to offer a little bit more color there. And Brex, Brex started with this concept of how do entrepreneurs get money when you don't have any track record? Like literally you don't have any track record. They had to also rely on something we've talked about already, open API. They had to get data and they had to do it, as you said, in an efficient, elegant way to get that data and get access. Uh, do you have cash in your account, so to speak? And now they've grown up a certain expertise uh, in that in that sort of startup world, and it, and it's not equity that they're funding; it's it's loans basically uh, against the cash flow. What you'll see also on here is, as I said, some of the big tech companies like Amazon and Tension and Alipay. You see some of the really now incumbent fintechs as some folks would call them like Stripe and Square and PayPal and Intuit that, that have built up a long history now, either in the payment space or in the tax prep and accounting space. So some have come from accounting, some have come from the payment side where they're getting data and corporate business relationships. What you don't see is a lot of the challenger banks that we're gonna talk about in our next class. Now Prosper is here they've started to offer some lending side to the corporate side. Most of the challenger banks and nearly all of the marketplace lenders that are of size are in the household sector rather than the corporate sector, which I find sort of of, of interest. I don't know if there's a question. Uh, uh, we have two hands raised, Camilo and then Carlos. All right, and then we're gonna, we're gonna go to the household sector. Okay, this is about the household. Um, I'm sure you know about this uh, Brazilian unicorn called Nubank. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to be talking about Nubank a fair amount next uh, Monday as well. Okay, I, I just want to know, um, well, maybe next class, if you think that their business model about um, giving online credit cards to, I don't know, like I think it's like 8.5 million people already who, who have a, a Nubank credit card is uh, sustainable because I don't know what the, their specific innovation um, apart from you know accepting applications online of credit cards. Just like I'm wondering if that's going to be a, a, a they're going to have a Let, you we'll know, some default problem. 
we'll dive more into New Bank in the next class, but let me just generically say, I think that it's the, it's the reality of startups that more will fail than succeed. Now, as it specifically relates to credit cards, in the credit card space, the big incumbents, the big incumbents aren't going to keep the whole market. And, and maybe I'll, that leads me uh, for, for a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to, to mortgages a second. This is the U.S. credit card system. It's not Brazil. But the big seven, what I call the big eight, meaning the big four or five banks, American Express, Discover, and Cap One, kind of control 80%, 78% as of last year, credit card business. There are a lot of economies of scale. There's a lot of economies of scale back to managing risk and balance sheet. Credit cards as opposed to mortgages are not guaranteed in any way by the US government. It has a very different uh, risk profile. This is about a, a little over a $1 trillion asset class market in the US. But 22% are smaller providers. And so Amazon, for instance, partners with Synchrony Bank, and Amazon has the Synchrony card. Amazon also, I think, has something with JP Morgan as well. You'd probably say Amazon will be sustainable. Amazon is such a phenomenal uh, uh, profit generator, particularly with the crisis now. I can't speak to like any one startup, can they chip away at this 22%? Yes, they can by using alternative data, but the big seven or eight are not asleep. They're not ignoring alternative data, but, but a new startup can sort of say, maybe we can approach this in a different way and particularly provide a better user interface. Here in the US, what's happening is rather than credit card products they're providing, personal loans. Um, but let me hold, hold on that for a second because I want to go back to, to uh, the mortgage market. Just I mentioned this in the mortgage market. Uh, these are figures from 2018. These are the largest mortgage originators in the U.S. It doesn't mean that they bought these loans and held them on their balance sheet. The yellow are sort of the non-banks. And Penny Mac, for some reason, is not on here. They should be. But of the top 10, five, the yellow, are non-banks. Now, do we call them fintechs? Absolutely, they are giving a different user interface with the public, and, and, and they've just taken off. Part of it is regulatory. Part of it is since the 2008 crisis, holding loans on a balance sheet to become less attractive to the big banks in terms of their capital charges and the like. Part of it is also because in the U.S., this is highly tied to the government-sponsored enterprises. But big disruption in the last 12 years that about half of the loans are originated by, broadly speaking, you know, the non-bank sector, who are largely then laying it off to the asset securitization marketplace. Um, disruption of the past, I believe there'll still be disruption in the future in this space. Back to the credit card side, what we were talking about there with Camillo, and I'll pause if there's other questions. I just want to take a look also at China. China's biggest credit card issuers, all that are building upon that Union Pay platform we talked about. Union Pay was started by, I think, 84 banks in China, really with the People's Bank of China bringing that together. Union Pay is that one sort of backbone of their whole credit card payment system. Interestingly, as dominant and as strong as Alipay and WeChat Pay are, and in that sense, WeChat Pay and Alipay leapfrog the banking system, there's, there's real growth going on in the credit card business. But not from disruptors and startups, it's sort of like the commercial banks getting back into it. Romain, were there some questions? Yes, Alessandro. Please. Yes, Gary, I'd like to get your point of view on, uh, on the following topic. So I was thinking about how these cr new credit card uh, fintech companies work. And uh, most of them, if not all of them, they have, they got to partner up with the bank, right? Because unless they have huge amount of cash to anticipate, they got to partner up with the bank that gives actual credit. It, so it's either, let me just pause for that. They either have to partner with a bank, which is, is the issuer bank partner model. And we yeah. 
we're going to get to Lending Club, I promise, that has that issuer partner, that bank that's a partner, or they tap into the securitization markets. Yeah, so, exactly. So, and for those who are not familiar, asset securitization is the concept that the securities markets are the investors in the loans rather than holding it on a bank's balance sheet or a finance company's balance sheet. And that innovation, asset securitization, starting in the mortgage markets 40 plus years ago, uh, moved to the credit card uh, markets by, in, in a robust way by the 1990s, uh, is a very real way to sort of lay off that side, meaning find somebody else to be the investors rather than have a balance sheet. So back to you, Alexandro. It's either, either a partner bank or asset securitization. So in the end, these guys, these fintech companies are a second intermediary, right? So how much money do they actually make? Because I, I'm thinking like the more and more companies we can see, the fees are going to go down. So competition will drive their fees down. They also have to pay a fee to, it's either a balance sheet bank or um, in the case of securitization to... So, so you're absolutely right, but... The financial intermediation has multiple layers and the more advanced an economy is usually the more the layers and the more com more competition in the market more the layers and you might think of layers as inefficiency it might be but often layers bring efficiency and competition so some financial firm is doing the origination. This is brokering and selling and providing a user interface. And they might not want to be the balance sheet lender. They might say, I'm going to partner with the bank to be the balance sheet lender. What we're going to do is we're going to compete and give the most remarkable, robust user interface and brokerage. In the mortgage market, back to that, the Quickens and United Wholesale Mortgage and Penny Mac that aren't on here, by and large, only hold the mortgage for a few weeks, a few days, maybe a couple months. They have a warehouse line of credit to do that, and then they securitize the rest. But the mortgage market in the US has a very robust securitization market. You asked about credit cards. Credit cards, this 22% that, that's competing with the rest does not have as big a robust securitization market. Of the trillion dollars in the US, I think the credit card securitization markets about 150 to 200 billion, if I recall. Um, so, so it's harder, but you also might be that company, the new bank, as Camillo asked, that has a better use of underwriting and data and so forth. Um, what somebody wouldn't give for Credit Karma's data with 106 million files, that's a robust data set. Now into it, we know, paid five billion. So maybe we do know what somebody would pay for it. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't diminish being at one particular slice. If you can find the slice in the value chain and compete away some of the incumbent's margin, credit cards are very big business, trillion dollars in the US, very big in Europe and Asia as well, growing in China rapidly. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of margin. I would say the thing that's competing the most, and I'm going to jump ahead, but Alexander, stay with us uh, for a minute, is, is the personal loan business. Personal loans differ from credit cards in an important way, is that credit cards are what's known as a revolving line of credit. Each, each purchase adds to your credit balance, you have a limit, if you're high, uh, if you're super prime or prime borrower, your limit's higher. If you're subprime, your limit's lower. That business of revolving credit, about a trillion dollars in the US, we now have this personal loan business. It's only about one sixth the size, about 160 billion in the US. That personal loan business is generally term financing, a specific term that you have to have an installment loan and pay once every month for 36 months or for 48 or 60 months. The underwriting risk of a term loan is lower than the underwriting risk of credit card business, of revolving credit. 
the personal loan business is where most of the disruptors are. The SoFi's and the Prosper's and the new banks and, the, and so forth. They're trying to break in in the personal loan side as much or even more than the credit card side. Um, but I don't know if Alexandro, did you want to follow up on anything? No, no, no. My point was just uh, I, 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 th I don't know if you agree on the fact that we will see a massive um, wave of uh, mergers between these these companies. Because uh, I mean, in my mind, there is uh, there is not much room for um, all these hundreds of companies that are just popping up like mushrooms. <laughs> I think, I think we'll see mergers and I think we'll see failures. But the question is, is, is there an opportunity in the midst of all that? Is there an opportunity uh, uh, along the way? We've seen in the payment space a lot of consolidation in the payment system providers, the PSPs, but there's still a lot of opportunity for sector-specific payment companies. And we've even seen that the, the data aggregators in the payment space have started to combine and, 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 and be bought. We're at that sort of phase of things. I think in the credit space, in the household credit space, we're gonna see still a lot of competition in personal loan. And I think in the personal loan side, they will be chipping away at some of the profit margins, will be trying to at least, of the incumbents in the credit card space. And interestingly in China, the credit card space is trying to chip away at what Alipay and WeChat Pay built up because you know there was a like a reverse over there that's happened. Um, whether they'll be completely successful, another story. Um, Thank you, Iqbal. Iqbal, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I have a question on that um, point that you brought up on uh, Union Pay being a. Uh, uh, an attractive uh, alternative to Alipay and WeChat Pay. Well, uh, I do you know? Attractive. I'm just going to say they're, they're, it's been growing more quickly than I might have thought. Like, you know, they, that I wouldn't count out credit cards uh, in China. <laughs> They've been growing. Would you know what were the value propositions of uh, Union Pay that kind of like tilt consumers to opt towards uh, Union Pay? <laughs> well, I'm not, I mean, maybe some of our fellow students know uh, better than I. But I think, listen, you can't count out that there's a distribution channel when you have 84 banks and particularly the six or eight big banks in China that own a piece mm. of uh, mm. and, and all the hundreds of millions of people there. They're not mm. asleep. As big tech comes in, the incumbents don't rest. It's competition. Mm. So, but they do have the advantages of an incredible distribution channel, meaning the, the depositors and clients of those banks. Um, the product itself, the revolving credit product, the classic credit card product, uh, has a little bit more flexibility than something just on an e-money wallet. And it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that Alipay and WeChat Pay can't offer something that is pretty much identical to a credit card. That's right. But, you know, their balances and the like might be different as well. But I'm not sufficiently close to it. Okay. Um, cool. No. Thanks, Gil. Um and I might pull us. I might pull some data for next class. I'll show you what I'm talking about there. Um, personal loan business, just to give you a percentage of unsecured personal loans. Who's making unsecured personal loan? And again, a personal loan is not tied to a credit card. It's usually an installment or term loan. But you can see the shift just in these five years. That the the the, the disruptors are are sort of eating into the market share in this space. Here are some of the personal loan companies. Not a lot of overlap. Prosper is on both lists, but not a lot of overlap with the list to the small and medium size. And uh, Camillo, I'm glad I have New Bank on here, but we'll come back to a few of these when we talk about challenger banks. Revolut, New Bank, uh, a number of these are really what we also call as challenger banks. Um, student loans. I could probably ask for a show of hands, how many of you have a student loan by one of these? And, and, and the, in the US, the private student loan market is only a small share. Student loans in the US are dominated by our Department of Education, 
Uh, over 92% of student loans in America are either guaranteed or direct loans from the Department of Education. But of course, the private loan market, where graduate students, and particularly those who are not US citizens, are more likely in the private student loan market. These are probably familiar names to many of you, whether you used Empire, Prodigy, or, or others, basically to shop for a student loan or a traditional bank like SunTrust and Wells Fargo. Um, and that 8% of that market is still about 100 plus trillion, 100 plus billion dollars, sorry, because the overall student loan market is uh, 1.6 trillion. Um, so not small numbers. Um, so marketplace lending, I did say we would get to this. Um, it's an online platform connecting borrowers and investors. So it's sort of a platform in the, in the middle, started with this concept of being peer to peer. And so this is a look at Lending Club from their own documents from last summer. Lending Club, three million plus borrowers on one side of, of the platform economics, 200,000 plus investors on the other side. Now don't think of it as three million and 200,000 because it gets more concentrated than that. But Lending Club sits in the middle between borrowers and investors, or you might call lenders, but investors but they partner with issuing back. They don't wanna take a lot of this on their balance sheet. They take some of it onto their balance sheet, but they wanna basically have issuing bank partners, plural, because they keep some banks in competition. And so what Lending Club is providing is the platform and some of those issuing banks, they're not the Bank of Americas, but they're much smaller banks say, all right, we don't have that front end. We don't have that platform, that user experience. Lending Club provides that. And the investors on the other side of a Lending Club are often hedge funds and asset managers who are saying, we can uh, uh, um, uh, invest. Lending Club is providing us a portfolio of loans and you can see the numbers here, 16 month average duration, one in 1 1.6 to 7.5% range of returns. That's a pretty wide range of returns. And who are they? Managed accounts means it could be, it could be an account at BlackRock or Fidelity that says we're gonna put a little bit of money into this, this credit market and the like. Um, now Luke was right, Lending Club and many of the other marketplace lenders were quite a dream Lending Club having to go public, and then their market value came down quite a bit uh, as they had to sort of prove out whether they could make money. Where have they been in these last 10 years? Just to give you a sense, in 2010, only it was $100 million of originations, but it was all retail originations by and large. By 2018, the retail, which is a very small part of it, they're, they're originating very quite a, quite a different bit of of, of loans, how they're originating these things. Um, and China, I just want to mention, China went through a remarkable wave of peer-to-peer -peer lending. And then the People's Bank of China felt, no, we've got to, we've got to get control of this. I mean, literally there was 2,700 peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms in China just four years ago. And, and most recent statistics down to about 300 plus. Uh, and, and in November of 2019, uh, the official sector in China still said, this isn't right. The peer-to-peer -peer lenders need more regulation. In essence, they need bank-like regulation. And what's interesting is back to Lending Club. Lending Club has actually announced the purchase of a bank. Um, Romain, I think I saw a hand go up. I don't see any, Gary. Oh, okay. Um, but qu there were questions earlier about Lending Club, so. Uh, yeah, so now we have two hands raised. Let's okay. go first with Jose. Yeah, so I'm not super familiar with Lending Club, uh, but uh, I'm familiar with another one in Europe. I think that the way it works is a bit different, and I, I would like to hear your opinion on that model. Um, sorry? Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. Yeah, yes. so, so it's called Mintos. And I think it's the biggest one in Europe. And basically what they do is there's a group of uh, loan originators that are independent companies 
that create these loans and give out these loans. And then this, uh, they sell the loans to independent investors, but they guarantee the payment of the loan. So if the, um, if the person that asks for the loan doesn't pay, the loan originator pays for that, uh, for that payment to the, to the investor. So basically the risk for the investor is that the loan originators uh, go bankrupt. I don't know if there's something similar in the US to that. Well, so what you're saying is, is how they're managing the risk. Uh, the investors are taking a credit risk on the platform, the originator, rather than taking a credit risk on the portfolio of loans themselves. Yes. So you, you, there's basically like uh, one more layer in between. So there's like uh, the loan originators that there's like hundreds of companies, then the platform that connects the loan originators with the investors. And uh, basically the investors invest in specific loans, but that are guaranteed by the loan originators. Why, why don't we do this? Why don't you uh, shoot me an email and I'll try to take this up in our next class and I'll look at the company more specifically. But to the point, there's no uh, reason you can't um, uh, find a new model as to who takes the credit risk. Credit risk is inherent in lending. Somebody is gonna repay on time and others are gonna fall into delinquency or even default. And so then the, the, the structure of a, of, a, of a market, whether it's mortgages, credit cards, personal loans, small businesses, the structure of a market might uh, evolve as to how to how to slice up who bears that credit risk and there's not just credit risk there's prepayment risk there's there's interest rate risk there's numerous financial risks and so what's just being highlighted by Jose and I apologize I just don't know that model is that that the investors rather than bearing the direct credit risk of the borrowers are, are, are having some of that held by others and they're bearing the risk of the intermediary in between, the platform in between. And, and in essence, that's true in the US mortgage market, a very different part than what you asked about, but the US mortgage market conforming loans are guaranteed by the government or by the government sponsored enterprises so that your risks then are a little bit different. It's not the credit risk. In the U.S. mortgage market, you have prepayment risk. Will somebody pay the mortgage early as interest rates might go down and so forth? And then in parts of the U.S. mortgage market that are not the conforming mortgage market, you did have credit risk because the government wasn't guaranteeing. And a lot of the subprime mortgage mess that we got into in 2008 was around that. But rather than taking time now, why don't you shoot me an email I'll look at this specific company and come back. Um, Romain, were there other hands up? Yes, let's go with Akshay. Uh, hi, Professor. So I had a question with the business model of uh, uh, Lending Club. So what is the role of uh, issuing banks uh, in this case? So issuing banks basically are, are lending their balance sheet. So let's say an issuing bank has its own availability of depositors and has not built the front end of, to the borrowers. So the issuing bank is standing in to do that. In addition, in addition, they're actually papering and documenting the loans. So as you see on this chart here, the issuing bank is sending the, the, the loans out and taking it in so there's a regulatory reason that the issuing bank is there. So the issuing bank might issue the loans and hold them, or the issuing bank might issue the loans and then literally, as this chart shows, resell them to Lending Club and Lending Club sells them to investors. So there's a bit of, it's similar to what's called a warehouse line. The, the, the issuing bank is standing there ready to take loans but then resell them because they're only, they're, their capability is only a certain size. Lending Club says they did $10 billion of loans in 2018, if I recall the number. The issuing bank doesn't want to put 10 billion on 
but they're providing the liquidity for the first few days or weeks until Lending Club then provides the investor to buy the loan. So it's, it's similar to a warehouse line, but it's actually a purchase and sale. They purchase the loan or issue the loan and sell. There's also a bit of regulation that you actually have a bank involved. And part of what, part of what was going on both in the UK and the US as this, these marketplace lending started, peer-to-peer -peer lending started, is the platforms didn't want to frankly register and be regulated like banks. They needed somebody else to make the loan to have that interface. I've oversimplified. I probably a lawyer would tell me I've gotten it a little bit wrong, but you know. And Thank then you. we have Adam who would like to provide some insight on union pay. Please, please. And then kind of close on alternative data. Yeah, what in, in response to Iqbal's earlier question about union pay. Um, so union pay is a state owned credit and debit card network, right? Um, so uh, the one thing that uh, separates them from the to duopoly between Alipay and WeChat Pay, which dominates 90% of the market, is that it can be, well, among other things, um, they, they can be used for all mobile devices and computer browsers. So technology-wise, they do have an advantage because for WeChat Pay, uh, it's, it's quite restrictive in terms of uh, technology because they use mostly on mobile. And unlike Alipay and WeChat Pay, uh, Union Pay actually supports almost all currencies and operates in many countries besides China. Also a feature that both Alipay and WeChat Pay are struggling with due to the sort of the peculiarities of the Chinese uh, legislation. And um, the one thing is that what Union Pay focuses on is the fact that they focus on the, uh, the efforts of those Chinese account holders because most people, in fact, majority of the people who owns a credit card will be a union pay uh, holders. They're focusing on people who travel abroad, predominantly to the US, in fact. So if you see you know, a lot of shops um, that are targeting for Chinese customers and travelers, you would see that sort of union pay, they could actually pay by union pay. So these are the edge that they have over Alipay and WeChat Pay. And that's just in response to the earlier question Iqbal has. Yeah, what I'm going to do is, because we only have two minutes, is I'm going to hold off and talk about alternative data when we uh, start up uh, our next session on challenger banks and, and the like, and just uh, close out with um, a, a, a little comment, if, if I might, on um, uh, just to sort of uh, uh, what I've already said in our first class on professionalism. I hope the slide is there. but. Uh, um, 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 again, is that I, I just want to sort of lend to you again from my years of experience. Um, we're in a very unusual time now it, with the Corona crisis, and we're even at MIT in this this, this Zoom classes and a pass emergency, no credit emergency, and the like. But I would just sort of share with you my own observation that for those of you trying to get the most out of this MIT experience, it's not easy. In, in some ways, it's just frustrating as heck, I'm sure. But again, to the extent that you can, to the extent you can come prepared and be curious and, and, and reach out to faculty members like myself and leverage off of our experience, take office hours, I would do it. I know this is like a lousy time, a lousy time. I'm just sort of reminding us all of that and saying, take whatever you can out of this MIT experience, even if it's diminished in some way. I, I just, I wanna make myself available again. If you find the readings of interest, do them. If you can't get through them because you're distracted and you're looking for a job, I get that, I get that. I'm just saying, the more you engage, the more you will invest in yourselves and get out of it. And on plagiarism, and I say this just to remind people again, there's probably, it's gonna be hard for any of you get no credit emergency, but somebody might get no credit emergency if you submit like a thousand word paper and six or 800 words are plagiarized. That's kind of your pathway right into that no credit emergency. 
it's easy to avoid because you know if you're taking like a lot from something else. And I just say this because I have had those experiences. I just mention it again, just because I want to do you the favor of helping you make sure that even in these unusual times that you protect your yourself if you want to get these nine credits on your on your uh, transcript. Um, but mostly, I, I, put, I put this up again at this part of the semester just to say, we want to make this MIT experience as, as good, given all the challenges as we can. And, and we know it's just like a heck of a crazy time. Um, uh, but to the extent you want me off hours or another time, or you've got questions that I'll further research, just let me know. Or if you have a FinTech startup, let me know and I'll be all in. I'll read that too. I had one student recently send me a whole paper on a fintech startup, you know, just outside of this. It's not an assignment, but they're engaged in a startup, and I'm going to review it and give some feedback. So, um, 